Lecture 14, on Ethics, Contemporary Moral Problems. Simulated Killing, Applied Ethics 6. 1. Introduction, Ethics is, typically, called practical philosophy because it is intended to inform our behavior in the real world. So why are we discussing unreal issues like simulated killing in this chapter of an ethics book? This is essentially the question our text opens with, in this first section of this chapter. It is suggested that, just because something is not real, doesn't mean it is not subjectable to ethical analysis. This is, of course, true. We can question the ethics of fictional characters, after all, whose moral or immoral deeds do not exist, any more than they do. Therefore, our text suggests we apply these ethical theories that we have been examining in this text, to the contemporary moral problem of simulated killing. Indeed, this concern regarding simulated killing has been in the public eye numerous times since at least the early 90s, but perhaps even longer. I can remember vividly, awkwardly looking at my friends as our mothers condemned computer and console platform video games such as Mortal Kombat, Wolfenstein, and, especially, Doom. We all played those games back then, and some of us had to hide it from our parents. Of course, in the 80s and 90s, the issues were new and had more of an impact at the time. The fear of video games and their supposed influence on children's behavior and development has dwindled incrementally since those early days. There have been upticks in concern since the 90s, such as when reports of people committing atrocities in attempts to re-enact their favorite games hit the media, but they failed to spawn the massive public movements we've seen in the past, which also failed in banning violent video games. Our text gives credit to Michael Lacewing and also Gary Young, who authored Ethics in the Virtual World, The Morality and Psychology of Gaming, for informing this portion of our text. Of course, simulated killing is not actual killing, but it can mean more than one thing. Simulated killing can take the form of observed killing in various media, video games, and other simulations, such as virtual reality. The objection that considering the ethics of simulated killing is a waste of time is motivated by the premises that it is not even real, and that no one is actually hurt. However, our text would have us consider a thought experiment and three other examples, namely. 1. A local high-security prison has a large number of child killers. They often riot which causes massive destruction and suffering. However, the prison warden proposes a way of stopping the rioting. At little cost, each inmate can be given his or her own virtual reality headset that gives each prisoner the ability to engage virtually in his or her favorite child-killing fantasy. Experiments have shown that the immersive nature of this seems to act like a safety valve and prisoners become quiet and helpful and are willing to get involved in educational and community programs. Should they be given the headsets? 2. It is common for armies to use very realistic computer gaming to train their soldiers. Imagine that soldiers are currently fighting in Syria and their Syrian training simulator, along with realistic Russian and US soldiers, realistic maps, civilian sites such as mosques etc., is released for sale. Is there anything wrong with this? 3. As part of one level of the video game Call of Duty, Modern Warfare 2 you are expected to participate in a mass shooting of civilians at a Moscow airport in order to pass yourself off as a Russian terrorist. If you play this level are you doing something morally wrong? 4. In June 2015 a video game called, Hatred, was released. The aim of the game is simple, to kill as many civilians as possible. The gamer controls the character through a town, shooting, burning, running over, blowing up, and executing random innocent people. Equally controversial is Super Columbine Massacre RPG where players can play Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold and reenact the Columbine High School Massacre. Is it morally wrong to play such games? Our text assumes that we would find some or all of these objectionable, perhaps even morally objectionable. What I take to be the importance of these examples, as presented by our text, is that they seem to deflate the objection that simulated killing isn't real and, therefore, is outside the scope of practical ethical deliberation. 2. Utilitarianism and simulated killing, as our text points out, from the utilitarian point of view, acts considered in conceptual isolation are neither moral nor immoral. It is the consequence of an action that determines its moral characterization. 
Indeed, if playing these games leads to more pleasure than harm, then playing these games may be moral obligations for fans on this view. As our text also points out, the consequences of playing these games are empirical questions. Therefore, whether or not the gameplay is moral will depend on empirical findings. However, the findings have been mixed, at least as of the publishing of our text. So, there is no definitive utilitarian conclusion regarding the morality of simulated killing. Nevertheless, our text rightly speculates whether these games and films might lead to actual behavior. Indeed, how many of us were inspired to take up baseball after watching Sandlot, or skating after playing Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, or joining the military after watching Top Gun? It seems clear that media can influence our behavior and life choices, but that still doesn't seem to warrant moral restrictions on media generally, since, evidently, different people will be affected in different ways. Therefore, consequentialist theories can only guide us, on a case-by-case -case basis, in the light of individual results regarding the morality of simulated killing. 3. The Kantian and Virtue Ethics Approach A philosophically fun consequence of considering this issue is that it reveals the consequentialist moral force in typically deontological moral theories. For example, specifically in the case of Kantian ethics, we find that the answer to whether engaging in simulated killing is moral or immoral depends on the consequences of doing so. For example, recall that acts involving the mistreatment of animals, on the Kantian view, is only indirectly immoral. They are immoral since they increase the likelihood of degrading our moral dispositions to the extent that we may lose the required moral sensitivity to treat other properly moral agents that is, humans, morally. So too, in the case of virtue ethics, does the moral question of engaging in simulated killing depend on the empirical results of doing so? If the person's dispositions stand to suffer from the engagement, then it is wrong. This Aristotelian and Kantian concern is brought to the forefront by findings in cognitive science. Cognitive science, which is informed by neuroscience, linguistics, computer science, philosophy, and psychology, the primary discipline of concern considered by our text, reveals findings that are a particular concern to the Aristotelian virtue ethicist. For, evidently, when we engage in simulated killing through video games or film, we engage in the acts in neurally similar ways to physically performing the acts. When we view interactions between people in video games or film, our motor cortices are activated as though we were actually performing the viewed action in real life. Similarly, our somatosensory cortices are activated as though we are actually feeling the physical touch being portrayed. These facts of such simulations speak to the power of such simulations, as well as those of pornographic games and film. Indeed, to some extent, our brains don't know the difference. Therefore, acts of simulated killing will have a neural effect on us as moral agents, similar to that of actually engaging in the behavior, in the real world. The ramifications of these findings are obvious for the Kantian or Aristotelian virtue ethicist. For, films and plays, our text suggests that playing a killer in a play or movie could affect the actor in a similar way to playing the killer in a video game. This could be true to some extent, but it seems like there is too much more going on for an actor psychologically in that experience to distract them from the immersion necessary for that to be the case. It seems likely that the audience would experience the immersion more fully than the actors. Though not considered in our text, it seems that killing in literature could be considered along with these other media. Depending on the vividness of our imaginations, the immersion necessary to affect us could possibly increase progressively with the type of media with which we expose ourselves to killing. For example, depending on the imagination of the reader, literature may be less immersive than a play, a play less so than a film, more or less so than a video game, and a video game less so than virtual reality. With rapid advancements in VR technology, it may become so lifelike there will be little difference between simulations and actual reality. Therefore, if the Kantian and Aristotelian concerns are legitimate, killing in virtual reality may be near the top of the list of entertainment to avoid. However, as this is an empirical question, the jury is still out as to whether any of these concerns are justified. 5. The Paradox of Tragedy, or, more correctly, 
The Paradox of Negative Emotions Our text introduces the paradox of tragedy by painting a mental picture of discovering a horrific crime scene and how quickly we would escape the situation out of fear, disgust, and anxiety. No one wants to experience such things and yet films and games depicting such things draw huge audiences. This is the paradox of tragedy, we don't want to experience terrible things, yet we want to experience simulations of them. One proposed explanation is that the negative emotions we experience in real-life situations are qualitatively different from those experienced in simulations. However, it could also be possible that they are only quantitatively different, that is, simulation fear isn't a different pseudo-emotion, but the same real-life emotion, but to a lesser degree. In either case, given the moral significance of the phenomenon, it has its place in ethical deliberations. 6. Summary Our text concludes, simulated killing covers a number of different areas, it could involve playing the killer, or watching someone play the killer. In the first category, it could be an actor on film or stage, or it could be someone playing a video game. Initially, we might think that because it is simulated, this topic is outside ethics. But using utilitarianism, Kantian, and virtue ethical lenses we have shown that this is not the case. For utilitarianism whether it is simulated or not is not important, the question is how much happiness each of these activities generates compared to doing something else. If it is more, then we ought to do them, if not, we ought not. For the Kantian and virtue ethicist, the question is how being involved in simulated killing changes us as persons. If it makes us less able to be moral agents, for example, less rational or virtuous, then we ought not to be involved in simulated killing. However, the main lesson from this chapter is this, issues surrounding simulated killing are going to be addressed via psychology. Which is thus far inconclusive. So, it seems the best we can say is that, yes simulated killing is a moral issue, but the decision of whether a particular activity is morally right or wrong will be advanced via experimentation. 7. Questions and Tasks Before next time, please answer the following questions. 1. Reading 1 through 4, do you think that simulated killing generates a genuine moral issue? 2. Imagine a case in the future where one can buy ultra-lifelike AI robots. These robots can be killed. They will bleed, they have been programmed to beg for mercy, to whimper, etc. Once they have been killed they can be reset and killed again. Should we treat this case differently? What happens if the robots are so lifelike that people no longer know the difference between them and real humans? Does that change things? Three governments have censored video games, such as Call of Duty and Hatred. Are they right to do so? That is, even if we find them immoral, how might this relate to laws governing simulated killing? For use Google Scholar to find the most up-to-date research on the psychological effects of simulated killing, any version you want. What does the current psychological research tell us about the ethical issues raised in this chapter?